Hi everyone, welcome to today's presentation. So today for a change, I'm not going to talk about something directly related on simulations on this channel, but it is going to be related to my main area of research, which is probability. And I'm going to talk about something called the probabilistic method, which I think is very cool and useful to know. So this probabilistic method is in general associated with the mathematician Paul Erdős. So who was Paul Erdős? He was a Hungarian mathematician who is mainly known for two things. So one of them is his itinerant and somewhat eccentric lifestyle. He spent his whole adult life just traveling from one place to the other, visiting fellow mathematicians and relying on these people to provide uh, accommodation and food and uh, taking care of his laundry and arranging the next trip and all the time living out of only one suitcase. And the other thing he's well known about is that he authored about 1,500 research articles. Now, for a mathematician, this is really a lot. There may be other domains of science where a few people have written comparable number of articles, but in mathematics, articles tend to be quite long and it takes time to write and publish them. So there's no other mathematicians, as far as I know, who came any were close to this number of articles. And for that reason, we mathematicians have this little game which we call computing our Erdős number. So wh what is this? So uh, your Erdős number is one if you have co-written an article with Paul Erdős. If you have not, but you have co-written an article with a person whose Erdős number is one, then your Erdős number is two, and so on. And there are uh, databases about articles in mathematics that allow you to compute this number. So for instance, for me, apparently my Erdős number is equal to four, which is uh, an average number of articles for most mathematicians. So this apparently is somehow related to uh, the theory of networks and in particular small world networks. Now, today we are interested in Paul Erdős because he is often credited with inventing this so-called probabilistic method. Now, it's always hard to be sure. Uh, you will see the idea is very simple, so it's quite possible that other people did have this idea before him, but he is certainly one person who used this article quite a lot in his work. Now, instead of presenting this method in an abstract setting, I'm going to present it in a particular example because it's going to be more fun. You will see that the example is maybe a little bit contrived, but anyway, it will give a better idea on how this method works. So let's imagine that we want to organize a tournament. So it doesn't really matter what time of game it implies. So it could be soccer, football, it could be tennis, uh, table tennis, it could even be rock, paper, scissors. It doesn't matter. So what matters is the following. We have a certain number N of players or teams. It doesn't really matter whether it's single players or entire teams. What matters is that each team or player has to play against each other team or player. And in each match, we ask that there will always be a winner and a loser. So there will be no draws. And we are going to ask a certain number of questions. So two of them are easy warm up questions. So one of them is how many matches will be played. And the second one is how many possible outcomes there are. And then a more difficult question, but which will be related to this probabilistic method is, are there ways to say that some players or teams are better than others? We will focus on some particular ways of answering this question. 
All right, but let's start with a simple warm-up question. So first of all, counting matches. So let's assume for to start that we have just two players. Let us call them Alice and Bob. And how many matches will there be? Well, the answer is simple. There will be just one match, Alice against Bob. And one way of representing this is to draw what we call a graph. So a graph is a set of vertices, which are the players, which are joined by edges. In this case, there's one edge between the two vertices. Now let's look at three players. So, so in addition to Alice and Bob, who have to play against each other, we have a third player, Carol, who has to play against both Alice and Bob. So here you see that we have 1 plus 2, so 3 matches that have to be played. And you will see why I count in this particular way. Now, this number, this three, uh, these three edges, is the number of edges of what is called the complete graph with three vertices. So complete graph means that I draw all possible edges between vertices. Now let's move to four players. So we have a fourth player, David. So let me just write the matches we have counted before. So we had Alice against Bob. We had Carol against Alice and Bob. And now we have David who has to play against Alice and Bob and Carol. So now we have one plus two plus three which is six matches. All right, so now I guess you see the pattern here. So what will I have to do for, for a general number n of players? Well, it's quite simple, really. So player one, has to play against n minus 1 other players. So there will be n minus 1 matches involving player 1. Now for player 2, player 2 will also have to play n minus 1 matches, but I have already counted the match between player 1 and player 2. So I will have n minus 2 additional matches. And for player three, I will have n minus three additional matches and so on. So the number of matches between n players or teams is given by n minus one plus n minus two plus and so on plus two plus one. So I have to add all integers from one up to n minus one. So I'm sure many of you know uh, the uh, formula for, for the sum, but let me just repeat it here. Uh, apparently this formula for the sum was found by the German mathematician Karl Friedrich Gauss. And the story is that he was already kind of a child prodigy and his father arranged that he would be taught uh, mathematics with a uh, with a priest and uh, the story goes that actually the mathematics classes were quite boring for him and for that reason he tended to be a, a little bit uh, unruly and uh, so the teacher to calm him at some point uh, gave him the task to compute the sum of all integers from 1 to 100 
thinking that he would dutifully compute first one plus two and then add three and four and that it would actually occupy him for some time. However, being already quite clever at this young age, uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss very quickly found a much easier way. And here's a graphical way of explaining what he did. So let's assume that we want to compute the sum of the integers from 1 to 7. And I have plotted here squares. So in the first row there's one square, and then I have two squares, and three, and so on, up to 7. So the number of red squares here is exactly the sum of the integers from 1 to 7. But for the blue squares, I also have one square at the very end, two squares before, three, and up to seven. So actually, in this rectangle, the number of squares is twice the number I'm looking for. But I can also easily compute the number of squares in this rectangle, because this rectangle has dimensions seven times eight. So it's seven vertically and it's eight horizontally because I've added one square. So I know that the sum will be given by seven times eight divided by two because I compute uh, twice the, the number of red squares. Okay, and that is uh, seven times four, which is 28. But now you see how to generalize this very easily. So if I go from 1 to n minus 1, what I will have is a rectangle of size n minus 1 times n divided over 2. This, of course, if you know binomial coefficients, is exactly the same as the binomial coefficient n choose 2, because uh, of course, the number of matches between n players is exactly the number of ways to choose two players among these n players. So that was the first warm-up computation. Now let's also count the number of possible outcomes of a tournament. So what I mean by outcome is that I have a certain number of matches and I keep track of who is winning and losing every match. And there are different possibilities for this. And an outcome is a particular choice of possibilities of who wins and who loses. Now, how do we count this? So, so we know already that we have, let's say, capital N, that is N choose two, that is n times n minus 1 over 2 matches. Now, the idea is that for each of these matches, I have two possible outcomes. So for match 1, well, I choose a specific player in this match, and he can win or he can lose. So I have two possibilities. Now, if I look at the second match, for each of these possibilities, I again have two possibilities for who wins and who loses. So that makes four possibilities and so on. And I do that for all matches. So the total number will be two to the n. And that will be two raised to the power n times n minus 1 over 2 outcomes. So let's just look at a few examples to get a feeling for these numbers. So, okay, the simplest example is when I have two players, so they play one match and there are two possible outcomes. So either one player wins or the other one. For three players, I have three matches, as we've seen. And so I have 2 to the 3, that is 8 outcomes. And I can keep on going like this, but let's look at a bit more. Let's look at 10 players. 
So the number of matches for 10 players will be 10 times 9 over 2, which is 45. So in this tournament, we will have to play 45 matches, which is already quite a large number. But how about the number of outcomes? Well, the number is 2 to the 45. So to have an idea of how large this is, let me try to convert this into powers of 10. So 2 to the 45, I can, com I can rewrite as 2 to the 90 to the power 1 half. Now I do this because 2 to the 90 I can write as 2 to the 10 to the power 9. So it will be 2 to the 10 to the power 9 over 2. And 2 to the 10, that's 1024, it's a bit larger than 10 to the 3. So that's a bit more than 10 to the 3 times 9 over 2, which is the same as uh, 10 to the 13 and a half, or 10 to the 13 times square root of 10. Okay, square root of 10 is a bit more than 3, and so this is about 30 times 10 to the 12, so 30 trillion. So my point here is that already with a number of players that is not so large, 10 players, there is a large number of matches, 45, to be played, but that is nothing in comparison to the number of outcomes, which is uh, over 30 trillion. And this means that if we look at properties of these outcomes, it is out of the question to look at all these outcomes one by one. We will have to find some better methods to look at these. All right, but now let's move on to some more interesting questions, which have to to do with uh, what are uh, possibilities to, to rank the players. So here I've taken three players, A, B, C. So we know that there are eight possible outcomes and here I have represented them all. And so now what uh, I've done here is that I have used uh, directed graphs to represent the outcomes meaning that I put a narrow uh, for each match from the winner to the loser. So the first example here means that A has beaten both B and C, and B has beaten C. Now I have drawn some of these outcomes in blue and others in red. What's the difference between them? Well, if you look at these directed graphs, you, you realize that in the blue ones, there's always one player who has beaten the two others. So it means that in these six cases, it's quite easy to say who is the best player. So in the first two examples here, A is the best player, and then in the next two, B is the best player, and the next two, C is the best player. However, in the last two cases, there's no best player because each player has beaten another one and has been beaten by the other player. So let us make a definition. Let us say that a tournament is undecidable if there exist outcomes, so at least one outcome, in which each player has been beaten by another player. So we have just seen that for three players, the tournament is undecidable because there are, among the eight possible outcomes, there are two in which each player has been beaten by another player. And it's quite easy to see that in any tournament with at least three players, we will have the, the same the, the, the same effect, so it will be undecidable, simply because I can always have the situation where, let's say, player one has uh, beaten player two, 
and player two has beaten player three and so on and so forth. Okay, so one has beaten two, two has beaten three, and so on, uh, until player n, and n has beaten player one. Okay, so, so far it's not very interesting because the only tournaments which are decidable according to this definition are tournaments with two players, which are not really very large tournaments. So let us modify the definition a little bit and let us look at what we shall call two undecidable tournaments. So the idea is somehow to modify this definition in of being undecidable in such a way that it may be more difficult to satisfy. So let's say that a tournament is too undecidable if there exist outcomes in which not each player but each pair of players has been beaten by a third same player. So what I mean by that is that I can take any two players and it should always be possible to find a third player who has beaten these two players for a particular outcome. And the idea is somehow that if I don't have this property, then it means that I can always find at least one pair, maybe several pairs of players which have not been beaten by a, the same other player. And then I could argue that maybe these pairs of players are better than the rest and then I could make a selection again among these players and these pairs. So it would give one way of ranking the players in the tournament. So let us look at a few examples. So for instance, if I start with three players, A, B, C. So is it possible to have this two undecidability property. Well, what I need is that A and B have both been uh, bitten by another player. So A has to be beaten by C and B as well. So, okay, for the pair AB, there's no problem. But now what about the pair AC? Well, AC would have to be beaten by the player B. So B should beat both A and C. But you see here we have a problem because this is not allowed. So I immediately see that a tournament with three players cannot be too undecidable. Now what about four players? So we can start again in the same way. So A and B, let's say that they have been beaten by C. So I have this and that. All right. Now, another pair is the pair AC. So, now they can't have been beaten both by B because C has beaten B. So the only option is that they have both been beaten by D. Okay, so D has beaten both A and C. Okay, so now uh, the next pair would be BC. So is it possible? So B and C, uh, well, they can't have been beaten by A because C has beaten A, but they can have been beaten by 
D. Right, so now D has beaten both B and C. But I still have more pairs. So another pair is the pair C, D. And you see, uh, it's impossible uh, that another player has beaten both C and D because actually C and D have beaten both players A and B. So a tournament with four players cannot be too undecidable. Now we could keep doing this with uh, five, six and more players, but you see that it's kind of awkward. It's not very systematic. It's not a very nice approach to look at all these possibilities and it's not at all clear what will happen when the number of players increases more and more. So this is where the probabilistic method comes in. Now, let us assume the following. Let us assume that each match has a probability one half of being won by each player, and that independently of all other matches. So what I have now done here is I say I have a, a set of all possible outcomes, and it can be a very large set. We have computed how many uh, elements there are in this set. And now I'm putting a probability distribution on this set. It's a very simple probability distribution because independence means that each outcome will have the same probability, which is one over the number of possible outcomes. It's what we call the uniform probability. Now, the idea of the probabilistic method is the following. So let P be the probability of a match being too undecidable. That we will somehow have to compute or at least to estimate. Now, if we can show that P is strictly positive, then obviously there has to be at least one undecidable outcome, meaning one outcome in which uh, there exists a, a group of two players that has been beaten by a third player. So therefore the tournament has to be too undecidable. All right, so let us look at this probability. Can we compute it or at least estimate it? So let's start with something very easy. So I, I choose three players. Let's say I choose players one, two, and three. And I want to compute the probability that player number three has beaten both players one and two. And, and that is easy because the probability that it, he has beaten one is one half. The probability that player three has beaten player two is also one half. And because all matches are independent, I have to multiply these probabilities. So I get a probability of one over four. And now I can easily compute the probability that this does not happen. So what's the probability that player three does not beat both players one and two? Well, that is just the complementary event. It's the negation. And the probability will be one minus a quarter, that is three quarters. Okay, so now let us compute the probability that no other player beats both players one and two. Now, how many other players are there? Well, there are n minus two players because there are n players in total. And again, all these events are independent. So this probability will be simple, simply given by three quarters to the power n minus two, which is the number of players. Okay, so we are slowly advancing in our computation. Now, 
so far we have fixed one particular pair of players, which are players one and two. Now, of course, this whole argument does not depend on the particular choice of players. So we could also do it for players two and three and one and three and other choices. So now let's say we are given two pairs of players. Now, what is the probability that at least one of them has not been beaten by another player? So now here we have something of the form probability of A or B. Right, so we are looking for the probability that A has so A is the first pair has not been beaten by another player or, and it's the non-exclusive or, B has not been beaten by another player. But the events A and B, uh, they don't need to be disjoint. So for, for that reason, what we can use is that this probability is smaller than the sum of the two probabilities. In general, this will not be an equality. To get an equality, I would have to subtract the probability that both A and B occur. But th this could be done, but it's harder to compute, so let me just leave it at that. So what I get here is an upper bound. So the probability that at least one of these two pairs has not been beaten by another player, well, it is smaller or equal to the sum of the probabilities for each pair, but these probabilities are equal to 3 quarters to the n minus 2, so I get here 2 times 3 quarters to the n minus 2. Now I can ask the same question for all pairs. Now, how many pairs of players are there? Well, we have answered this before. There are n choose 2. That is n times n minus 2 over 2 pairs. So by the same argument as above, this probability here is smaller or equal to n times n minus 1 over 2 times 3 quarters to the power n minus 2. Now, by my definition of 2 undecidability, this probability is exactly the probability of the negation of being undecidable because being undecidable means that no pair has been beaten by another player. So the probability that my tournament is too undecidable, well, I know that it is larger or equal to 1 minus n times n minus 1 over 2 times 3 quarters over n minus 2. So I haven't computed my probability exactly. That is because I've used here this inequality. But it will actually give me some useful information because remember what I want to compute is, or at least to estimate, is the probability. I mean, I, I know that if this probability is strictly positive, then I know that my uh, tournament is too undecidable. So uh, what can I say about this function here? 1 minus n times n minus 1 over 2, 3 quarters to the n minus 2. Well, here I, I have plotted this function uh, in terms of n. So what one has to notice is that as n increases, well, n times n minus 1 over 2 does increase. However, 3 quarters to the power n minus 2 decreases faster than 
n times n minus 1 increases. So in the end, this uh, exponential part will win over the polynomial part. So 1 minus this function of n will actually increase towards 1. So for n large enough, it will uh, become positive. So what I've shown here is that the probability I'm looking at is bounded below by a certain function. Now, of course, I know that the probability is always between 0 and 1. So what happens is just that for n too small, my, my uh, approximate computation is actually just not uh, precise enough. So I get no information at all. But what you see on, on this plot, and you can easily check it directly, is that as soon as n is at least 21, the probability here will be positive. So that's the result here. There are two undecidable, two undecidable tournaments whenever the number of players is at least 21. And so again, the idea is that we have obtained this result of existence of such undecidable tournaments by not by trying to you know, look at all these possible graphs in detail, but we have used uh, an argument which is based on probability, which is rather simple as prob probabilistic arguments go. So we have used a bit of independence, we have used this probability of A or B, and a little bit of arguments on counting number of pairs and so on. Now, this result doesn't mean that smaller tournaments are not too undecidable. So the only thing we have shown here is that if there are at least 21 players, then for sure the tournament will be too undecidable. Now, how about smaller tournaments? Well. One thing one, uh, one can do is to use a computer and have the computer simulate lots of different tournaments and decrease the size. And if the computer finds one tournament which has this uh, property of being too undecidable, then you have, of course, the answer because you can always double check it. And in this way, uh, what I, I found is the following two undecidable tournament, which has seven players. So finding this by computer is an example of what is called a Monte Carlo algorithm. So it is very different from the probabilistic method. It is to generate random samples and testing the property on these samples. Now, you can check on this picture that indeed each pair of players has been beaten by another player. For instance, if I take here uh, my players 1 and 2, well, they have both been beaten by player number 5. Okay, and if I choose 1 and 3, uh, so let's see, they have been beaten by uh, player number six. And you can easily check that this works for any other pair of players. Maybe another representation that is a bit, arguably a bit easier to, to look at is the following. So uh, here, for instance, before I had, so player one, has beaten player two. So one has beaten two. So I put a, a blue uh, square here on the row one, column two, and a red square on the row two, column one, and, and so on. And okay, that's just another way of representing this particular outcome uh, by colors. And 
The claim is that for any, uh, so you can do it with lines or, or columns, so but okay, you take two lines, we will always find a column such that the player in the column has beaten the two players in these two lines. Now, you can actually prove that seven is the minimal number. So let's look at it here again. So we've already seen before that there are no two undecidable tournaments of size uh, three or four. So you can do a similar argument for five and six. It's a bit more involved, but you can do it. So seven is indeed the smallest two undecidable tournament. And that was actually proved by Paul Erdős in one of his articles. All right, so now that we have answered this question, we can make the, the question more difficult. So we can replace two by any larger integral integer k. So let k be an integer greater or equal to, and let us say that the tournament is k undecidable if there exist outcomes in which each group of k players instead of each pair of players has been beaten by another player. So of course k needs to be smaller than the number of players n, or the way why is, uh, this doesn't make any sense. But the idea is that we fix a certain k and then we look at larger and larger n and ask what happens. So it's actually not so hard to adapt the argument I've given before to this particular case. So again, I look at all my possible outcomes and uh, I see that I say that each match has a probability one half to be won by one player or the other. And all I have to, to do is well count for each uh, k tuple of players what is the probability that it has been beaten by another player and that gives you this part here. So, because there are n minus k other players, so this is the probability that uh, k tuple. Uh, so, uh, has not been beaten by uh, another player. And the, the other uh, part I have before, this n times n minus 1 and so on, divided by k, k minus 1 and so on. So that is actually n choose k. So that is the number of k tuples for n players. And so the probabilistic method will tell me if that if one minus this number is positive, then uh, there exists a k undecidable tournament, and that's the same as saying that this number here is smaller than one. Now again, what happens so if we fix k and n becomes large? Well, we have again this this phenomenon where the first factor here, the n choose k, will increase when n increases, but the, the second factor, the 1 minus 1 over 2 to the k to some power, that will uh, actually decrease very fast. So if n is large enough for given k, this condition will be satisfied, and so I know that my tournament will be k undecidable. So, for instance, let's look at the case n equals 3. So if, n equal, if k equals 3, what you find is that actually n equals 91 
does uh, satisfy this condition. So you can check. So what you have to check is that 91 times 90 times 89 divided by 3 times 2 times 1 times 1 minus 1 over 8 to the power uh, so 91 minus 3 that this quantity is smaller than 1 and if you do the computation you find something like 0 0.9577 so it is indeed smaller than 1 and if you do the same computation with n equals 90 instead of 91 you will find something which is larger than 1. You find something like 1.058. So this probabilistic method tells me that if I have at least 91 players, then the tournament will be 3 undecidable. So another question one can ask is how does n change when k becomes large? So now it is not so easy to study this, uh, this equation involving n and k uh, explicitly, but we can easily find a sufficient condition. So let us find a sufficient condition on n the tournament to be k undecidable. So you see the the n choose k, so this product n times n minus 1, etc., this one is smaller than n to the k. So a sufficient condition will be that n to the k divided by k factorial times 1 minus 1 over 2 to the k to the power n minus k should be smaller than 1. Now, whenever we have equations with powers, it's a good idea to take the logarithm. So let me take the log here, and I write log for the natural logarithm. So what I get is that k log n minus log of k factorial plus n minus k times the log of this 1 minus 1 over 2 the, to the k should be smaller than log 1, which is 0. Now, this, when k is large, log of 1 minus 1 over 2 the, to the k is very close to minus 1 over 2 to the k. So and actually it is always smaller. So again, uh, a sufficient condition I get by, by actually neglecting uh, everything which is negative here, which just uh, simplifies matters. One can be more precise, but that will be sufficient. So basically, uh, what I need is something like, uh, so sufficient condition would be that uh, n over 2 to the k, so I will also throw away the minus k here, so n over 2 to the k should be larger than k log n. And this suggests writing n as c sum new or uh, unknown c times 2 to the k and okay in, in that case log n what is log n it is 2 to the k log c plus uh, no sorry it is log c plus log 2 to the k, which is k times log 2. All right, and so I get that uh, if c is larger than 
uh, so k square times log 2. That gives me a sufficient condition. It's not necessary, but it is sufficient. Or, in other words, if I take n larger than log 2 times k squared times 2 to the k, that will be a sufficient condition. All right, but let's uh, look at again at the case k equals 3. So I told you here that 91 players guarantees you that the tournament will be 3 and decidable. Now, you can do the same uh, with a co computer. You can have it generate tournaments at random and check whether they are 3 undecidable. Now, checking whether a tournament is three undecidable takes more time because there are more possibilities with triples of players, and for larger k it takes even longer. But here, just you know, by having my computer generate lots of tournaments randomly, testing whether they are three undecidable and reducing gradually the number of players the computer found this solution with 60 players. Now, a few years ago, I, I wrote an article on this in a science outreach uh, website. And a bit later, a reader told me he had uh, done himself simulations and improved the algorithm. And uh, he has found this smaller three undecidable tournament, which has only 43 players. So the probabilistic method gives me 91 for the number of players guaranteeing the tournament will be three undecidable. I found 60 by computer, but this other person found 43 players. However, uh, as far as I know, uh, nobody knows what is the minimal number of players for a tournament to be three undecidable and even less is known for larger tournaments. And this is why the probabilistic method is so powerful, because whatever the number k of, you know, uh, in my definition of undecidability, it tells me that there will always be a number of players that will make the tournament k undecidable, and it gives uh, a bound on uh, this number of players, even though it is probably, well, it is even certainly not optimal. So let me just recap to, to finish up. So what I have shown on this particular example is uh, an instance of the probabilistic method. So one way of Describing it in general is the following. So let's assume I have a collection of n objects. And let me have a probability distribution on the set of integers from 1 to n. So what this means is that I have numbers p1, pn, which are between 0 and 1. And uh, their sum has to be 1. And I also ask that all these pi are strictly positive. And then what the method says, what it uses, is the fact that if a certain property has a, pro a positive probability, well, then there's at least one object in this collection having that, pro that property. And you can actually generalize the idea a little bit to uh, the following statement which says that if I have a collection of real numbers, then the average value of these real numbers cannot be smaller than all the numbers, and it can't be larger. So the, the average value is what we call the expectation in probability. So if I can estimate the expectation, it gives me some information on the smallest and largest value of these numbers. So this method has many applications in 
combinatorics, which is counting mathematical objects in number theory, in graph theory, as we've seen, but also in geometry and computer science. There's something called the Las Vegas algorithm that uh, uses similar ideas in information theory and so on. So I put some links in the description if you want to, to read more on this subject. So that's all for today. So thanks a lot for watching. Take care. Bye.